I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know, I know, I know, I know. Good day, welcome to Great White Retro. I'm Gord Fessick, this is my cat Toes. Our topic today is a little less computing and a little more fun. We've got an, an original Atari 2600 here, the 4-switch model, and we're going to get this thing ready for the Shawano uh, County Fair coming up in a few weeks. But in the meantime, we're going to do something about this video output. We're going to convert it for uh, composite video and S-video so people don't have to try to find uh, old monitors that can still do analog TV these days. Let's get her done. This one's actually in better shape than most, but I have found some machines that put out either so much snow or just nothing useful at all where you can barely see it. It's not even watchable, let alone playable. We're going to do something about that so that folks are not so dependent on these old analog capable monitors. This little doohickey is called the Ultimate Atari Video Adapter. It's meant for pretty much every Atari 8-bit system, including the game consoles, the 2600 for example. And I'm going to adapt this to use a connector similar to the Atari 800. Rather than have a bunch of ports on the back, I want to make this thing look a little better. But uh, this will take a cable from 8-bit classics and we'll be able to hook into an S-Video monitor or a Luma Chroma capable monitor like the Commodore 1702 or any of those things. The fun part's going to be how am I going to mount this connector? Well, we'll tackle that later on. First thing we're going to do is get this open and give it an inspection. This machine is actually in pretty good shape. It comes apart very easily with a standard Phillips screwdriver and four screws. Everything is more or less made into the top half of the case. It's one of the reasons why I want to take a different approach to mounting the S-Video connector. There we go. That connector I salvaged from my first VIC-20. And I think I'm going to put it on that side there because there's no traces there. There's just the Atari copyright there. I thought about replacing the RF switch with that, but you might still want to use RF video. I don't know why, but we're going to keep that on there. Let's get this cover off because several of the signals are only accessible from within inside this RF shield. Let's take a quick tour of the board. This is the MOS 6507 CPU, which is a 6502 compatible part, but with only 8 kilobytes of address space instead of the 64K addressable by the 6502. This is the MOS Riot chip, which has 128 bytes of static RAM and handles all of the input and output on the Atari 2600. This is the TIA chip and it handles all video and audio production on the Atari 2600. Notice that there is no firmware, there's no ROM, there's no BIOS. All of the firmware has to be provided by any game cartridge you insert. That makes the 2600 a very, very simple 8-bit computer. That's where I'm going to put that connector there. But first, let's get this process started. I'm going to use a diskette label here so I can try to mark out where these go. What I end up doing is I use the connector itself as a guide. I mark positions horizontally, then I mark positions vertically, and I'll use the connector as a straight edge to draw lines. And where certain lines intersect is where I will draw mounting holes for this connector. Okay, and I leave little hash marks where I intend to, to drill my holes. Okay, I think that's as good as it's going to get. Here we go with the cordless Dremel again. Now the two front pins worked, but not the others.
After enlarging those holes, it was still a tight fit, but it was a very stable and solid fit. I'm guessing my imperfect uh, hole positioning allowed this connector to grip onto the inside of the board there. That and some soldering technique underneath will make sure that connector is solid attached to the PCB. There we go. And fortunately, that connector placement avoided all of the traces on both sides of the board. Just the copyright Atari was affected. This makes it probably the least destructive attempt at getting an extra connector onto here. Now I am pulling five signals off of the TIA chip. I'm using these points here. The Atari 2600's TIA chip provides a composite sync, three luminance signals, and a chrominance signal. They can come from the chip itself, or they can come from nearby solder pads. These places are different depending on the revision of the 2600, but you can draw them directly from the chip pads if needed. The audio connector is a little more troublesome because I have to go directly onto one of these capacitors here. This is going to again vary from board to board. I'll provide a link to Atari Age where there's a forum for discussing using the UAV board on 2600s. On the UAV board itself, there are five connectors I'm interested in. The composite sink, three of the Luma pins, and the Chroma in pin. Pin number zero isn't used on a 2600. I was checking my work back and forth using the Atari Age forums as a guide to make sure I got the right TIA outputs to the correct UAV inputs. And I snagged my ground and plus five volts from this nearby capacitor over here. I made sure that it matched using my multimeter. You can grab these lines from almost anywhere on the board and it'll still work. Next, I use a technique where I drape the wire across the pin on the five pin uh, connector there. That will make a solid connection and it will also help hold the connector even stronger in place. Then I connect the corresponding wire to the UAV's outputs. The UAV came with a six cable uh, connector. I'm just using its wires for this. The ground pins I connect all together and again I make sure that it drapes all these connectors so that it again provides some structural support to the connector in addition to a solid electrical one. And there we go. That connector shouldn't be going anywhere. All right, that looks encouraging. So this is composite video. Hmm. How do I start? Oh, here we go. Don't have any sound, but I think that's because I muted it. Yeah, there we go. Now we got noise. Not bad, not bad at all. Let's try S video. So we've got two different input modes on this TV. I just have to select S video. Okay, both appear to be working. Okay, so this is Pitfall. There used to be a way I could tell the difference between these two. Let's see. All right, so it's definitely benefiting from S-Video. But if we really want to see the reason why we went to all this effort, let's get our TV back. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hearing all kinds of noise over the audio and I'm hearing various other artifacts. No noise, no artifacts. Now let's see about getting this thing put back in the case and we'll give the case a wash while we're at it. All right. So I gotta mount that board to the case. I first have to get the RF shield back on there, and that is, again, just with those twist tabs. Nothing too crazy. I wanted to use double-sided mounting tape originally, but I didn't have any on hand. So I ended up using a, a janky, a connect, <laughs> ended up using a janky collection of electrical tape to mount this uh, little board in place. I want to cover the underside so it didn't short out, then I just fastened it to the main board. I really should come back to this and use proper mounting tape. Next let's figure out where we're going to put the hole for this new connector. I use a similar technique where I use a floppy disk label to tape over the plastic and then I mark over the places where I want to cut with a regular pen. After getting that, I'll use a rotary file. Using the slow speed to remove burrs and the fast speed to remove material, I slowly eat away at the case, little bit at a time, until that connector fits. Almost there. I think a little more adjustment. I think I'm going to do this a little bit more, but for now the connector is fully exposed. So let's give this a try. Let's put the board back in the case. Let's not forget those felt pads for the toggle switches. It's a bit of a trick to get it in there, but there we go. You have to line up those ports in the back. And then the back case cover just pops straight on. Make sure you line up the front where the fake wood grain is and fasten it back into place with its original four screws. All right, let's test fit the connector. Okay, it seems to be fitting just fine. Nice job there. So this guy's a little dirty yet, but I'm going to take care of that off camera. So there we go. This might be the first Atari 2600 with an Atari 8-bit style video connector. And that is S-Video, and it is looking really good. And that is one way to shoehorn better video into a game console designed in 1978. If you would like to get this console for yourself, I'll be giving this thing away at the Shawano County Fair on September 2nd. If you want a chance to win, be a YouTube member and comment on this video with the word giveaway somewhere in the comment. Winner will receive this Atari 2600 console, they have an appropriate video cable from 8-Bit Classics, the set of controllers that you see here, two joysticks and one set of paddles, 
any duplicate cartridges we have, including Pac-Man here. And if you really want to plug it into an old RF TV, I'll even include the cable and an adapter so you can plug it into the coax port of that thing. Don't know why you'd want to do that, but it's still here and it still works. <laughs> At the booth, I'll also have several other 8-bit machines up for sale, especially my spare Commodore 64s. And if you see something there, make me an offer. I'll be able to take credit cards on site. Again, if you want a chance to win this Atari 2600, be a YouTube member and comment on this video with the word giveaway. Contest is open to ages 18 and up, and you need to be a resident of the United States or Canada. Good luck there if you're entering, and hope to see you at the fair. Until then, good day.